Ari has been here, I think, four times, or this is his fourth, uh, fourth time. And he is uh, one of the most dynamic and extraordinary speakers you're ever going to hear. He had the flu uh, for three weeks, was in bed, he told me the other day. And um, he wouldn't even come on the radio. I sat next to him last night, and I couldn't believe the passion or the energy. Uh, I'm going to introduce him, because he wants to stay to time. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Father Larry Richards. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Nah, you're blessed. Shut up. Blessed is what you are. Anyway, are you ready? Yeah. I don't think so. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Great God of love and mercy, hear us as we come before you. Help us to do your will. Set us on fire with your Holy Spirit that people may watch us burn. We beg you these things, Holy Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. And the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Now, again, the title of my talk is Be a Man. What is that in Latin, gentlemen? Yes. Estovir, exactly. I did a whole book on it. And uh, the reality was when I wrote my book, and gosh, it's 2009 now, I'm getting old, but it was for all my high school boys because I taught high school, all boys, for eight years. And in that time, by God's wonderful grace, we had 11 guys get ordained from my time there because I would sit there and hit the boys. You're not allowed to do that anymore. Be a priest, be a priest, be a priest. And so I'd say, okay, Father. <laughs> but my biggest thing to them was what it is it to be a man? And that has been very, the culture has messed that up significantly throughout the years. And so I always go back to David. Now, David is the one who does this, right? In 1 Kings, those, let me see your Bibles. Come on, hold them up. You've had me here before. If don't you pull out those phones, I'll kick your butt. Your phone. <laughs> you need a Bible, gentlemen. Let me see. Thank you, my Protestant brothers that are here with us this day. It's good that you're here, too. Now, do something with these Catholic pagan men, would you? Anyway, gentlemen, again, if you go and you, you see any uh, statue of St. Paul, St. Paul always he has in his hand what? A sword! Except if you go to the United States, 90% of all the statues of St. Paul, he has a sword and it's held down like this because... Oh, please. You go to St. Paul outside the walls in Rome, and it's his big statue of St. Paul in the center, and he has a sword, and it's held up. He's ready for battle. And the sword is what, gentlemen? The Word of God. It's a two-edged sword. So, gentlemen, we are called to battle. And the battle that we're called to is a battle of love. It's a battle that we slay people with love. My favorite thing is love conquers all, huh? That love is something that when we love people, we conquer them. And that's the strength. And so you need to get into the Word. So gentlemen, that means you need to get a Bible. Can you use your wife's Bible, gentlemen? No, that's like using her toothbrush. That's disgusting. You get your own Bible. And when you have that Bible, gentlemen, you keep it next to your bedstand, huh? You all have bedstands here? Say yes, Father. Good job. And so, and I'll bet you that you have your own side of the bed, those of you who are married, correct? That even if you got frisky the night before, you say, okay, my side. You get on your side. I'm on my side. And you get back on your side of the bed every day. Is that correct? I don't know that from my own personal experience, but I'm just hearing. But anyway, you have your own side of the bed, so you get to your own side of the bed. But what you need there is a Bible, because our saints, St. Jerome said what? Ignorance of the Bible is ignorance of Christ. You cannot know Christ unless you know your Bible. Gentlemen, it's just that simple. You know, the reason that the United States is in the way it is today, it's getting better in, in my opinion, but the problem is, is because men haven't been men. We have been used to being, you know, I call it womified, if you will, you know, feminized, and we want to just be nice. We got to be strong. You know, we got to be strong. But again, it's a strength and love. But you'll get that in the word. You don't ask Dr. Phil. You don't ask the newest congressman or president or a senator, hey, what is it to be a man? You go to God. Huh? And that's what I was trying to teach my boys. You know, they would sit there, and I know we have a coach here today, and God bless coaches in football, you know, even though God's a Steeler fan, sorry. But the reality is, you come here, and you look at a football player, tell me what it is to be a man. A football player or coach doesn't know what it is to be a man in himself. 
Playing football does not make you a man sorry. You and they look at the, they would sit there and watch, you know, the, uh, the, the, the musicians on TV teach me how to be a man. Musicians aren't going to teach you how to be a man. Movie stars sure as hell aren't going to teach you how to be a man. And that's what our kids look to. You go look to God the perfect man, Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament, you get the imperfect man who helps us all, which is David. Now, David was called what? Do you know what the word David means? Beloved of God. And David was talked about in the Old Testament and the New, and he was said that this uh, Old Testament and New, that here's this man, David. God calls out David as a man. And he says, this is a man after my own heart who will do my will. Whoa. Can you imagine if we become men after God's own heart that seek only to do his will? We'll set the world on fire once that becomes my mission in life to do, uh, be always after God's own heart and to seek his will. So the Estovir comes from 1 Kings, huh? And if you go to 1 Kings there, it's chapter 2, verse 2. And this is the last thing King David said to his son Solomon before David was to die. And he begins, he says, When the time of David's death drew near, he gave these instructions to his son Solomon. I am going the way of all mankind, which means he's going to die. The opening line in my book is... You are going to die. Nice way to do it, huh? It says, I'm going to go to the way of all mankind. Take courage and be a man. Esto vir. Take courage and be a man. And then he goes and says, slay my enemies and everything. But we won't go there. But anyway, so, but the reality is that what is this to be a man? What is it? What do I have to do? And the beginning is we... Go to his word to find out. So when you get your own Bible, and again, it has to be a Catholic Bible. Why does it need to be a Catholic Bible? There's seven more books in the Old Testament, correct, than, than, than the Christian Bible. Why? Because we follow the Septuagint. Why do we follow the Septuagint? Because Jesus followed the Septuagint. Huh? That's an oversimplification. But again, I've told this story a thousand times. But in the Sanhedrin, there was two different, uh, there was two different leaders. You had the Pharisees and you had the Sadducees, correct? Now, the difference, of course, the Pharisees believed in life after death and angels and principalities, and the Sadducees did not believe in life after death. That's why they're so... Sad, you see, you got it? The Pharisees believed in life after death. The Sadducees did not believe in life after death. That's why they're so sad. You'll think about that the rest of your life. You will never forget it. You'll go, that is so bad, so stupid, stupid, stupid. But you'll never forget it. That's the point. So again, there was more Sadducees after the destruction of the temple than there was Pharisees because a lot of the Pharisees became Christians. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. St. Paul was a Pharisee. And so when they got together to redo their scriptures after the destruction of the temple, they threw out seven books of the Old Testament. Why? Because all seven books had to do with Life after death, huh? So I've done a lot with Protestants at Promise Keepers and different things. When I'm at a, at a Baptist uh, convention and they're all there and I say, gentlemen, let me see your Bibles. And they all hold up their Bibles and they go, ooh. And they go, what do you have in your hand, Father? A Bible. Where'd you get one? Aren't you a Catholic priest? I say, excuse me, gentlemen, this was ours before it was yours, just so you know. But anyway, so... And I'll say to them, I'll say, gentlemen, open your Bibles to Sirach chapter 2. Would you Sirach chapter 2? And they're going... I go, oh... You don't have that one, do you? <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to hell. Anyway, but it sits there, it's great, because what's it do? It says, my son, when you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for trials. None of this la-la garbage, I was going to say crap like the bishop, but I was, but anyway, none of this garbage. What happened is that you and I don't come before God and say, if I follow Jesus, he's going to give me everything I want. Who's the number one preacher in the United States today? Yeah, right. <laughs> Joel Olstein, you all know Joel. Isn't he pretty? You know he is. He has a nice black hair. It's all curly, smiley, white teeth. God loves you. And they're going, yay! And we love to have our ears tickled. Sometimes we go to the priests, so they're the nicest priests that tickle our ears. Oh, just tell us God loves us. We want God to be Barney, correct? I love you. You love me. There's the big purple dinosaur in the sky. You know, gentlemen, just stop it. You know, I consider myself a spiritual coach. Why? Because if you go to your coach and you say, I want to be a football player, I want to be the best, and you go to your coach, ask the coach today if he's going to do this. And they go, okay, coach, what should I do? And he goes, I like you just the way you are. 
Just show up for practice once a week for 45 minutes to an hour if it's not too much. Or I don't want to ask you if it's going to get you mad. Just try to show up once a week, 45 minutes to an hour. And, and, and if you can, have some good thoughts about the game. What would you do with the coach? Get out of here. Yet that's what we want from our priests, isn't it? Oh, guys, just come to church when you feel like it and give some money, huh? I need the money. And just show up if you can. And, uh, you know, God loves you and it's all okay. And he understands that you're a weak person and it's okay. Isn't that bad? This is what we want spiritually, and yet to win a football game, we want all this garbage? You know, like, for instance, when I, my school, when I taught at the all-boy high school, we had anywhere from 650 to 700 boys. One year, we had 666 boys. Six, 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 the sign of the Antichrist. So he threw one out the first week to get rid of that number. But anyway, <laughs> the big fight every year was, what's more important, God or sports? What do you think won? Sports, absolutely, they're all going to hell. The reality is, we put all this time and energy into sports, right? Now, again, at my, at my school, they'd sit there and they could not miss a practice. If they missed a practice, they did not play in the game on Saturday, right? And they'd come in, you missed a practice, you don't play. I don't care if your mother died. We have to make your decisions. What's more important? This is the most important. And isn't it amazing? Those guys would work, and we became state champions in every sport there was. And in my year, we beat Central Bucks West in Hershey, Pennsylvania in overtime. Those other team had never lost a game until they met my boys, right? But already, these guys are 38 years old now. They have their own children. And they'll sit there and they'll tell their sons, when I was your age, son, I was a state champion football player. And they just look at their dad now and say, shut up, dad. You're just fat and bald now. Nobody cares. <laughs> There's nothing worse than a has-been. This is the way I used to be. Isn't that a sad thing? What are you now, sir? If that's your whole life, I threw a football and I was great. Woo! Really? That's it? That's what you did? I got a lot of money for it. So? That's it? You didn't change the world. You didn't bring people to Jesus Christ. You didn't teach your own children how to be men. You didn't, those who are men. You didn't sit there and be a person of great love. You threw a football, huh? Wow. Now, I'm not against football in any way, shape, or form. But I'm saying, if you're going to put all that time and energy into sports, you better double it for God. Double it for God. You know, again, can you practice every day? Sure. Can you? And again, when I hear confessions today, and we'll talk about that later, I'll do a confession talk. And one of the biggest things I'll ask you, I have a question, and I'll say, do you pray every day? Number one answer for men? I try. I try. And I say, come here. Whack! You try! Do you try to eat every day, sir? Well, no. Do you try to watch a sports game today, sir? Well, no. Well, why would you try to pray? It's bull crap when you sit there and say you try to pray. Again, I was at a men's conference years ago in Loretto, Pennsylvania, and a professional basketball player who was a deacon was there, and he's talking to the guys and says, you know, guys, I know it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Could you just try to pray every day? How about while you're driving to work, is think about, you know, take 10 of those little bumps on your steering wheel and try to say 10 Hail Marys. And I'm sitting there listening to this, and I'm thinking, I'm going to kill him. I'm just going to kill him. So everybody clapped. He was gone. I came up. Now, he left by God's grace. And I said, wasn't a deacon great? Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. Gentlemen, he says, try to pray every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, gentlemen, you pray every day or you go to hell. Do you understand? <laughs> we like the deacon better. <laughs> oh, please. Isn't that something? Gentlemen, I'm not here to pansy you today. I am here to make you a saint. That's it. You know, once I sat there and I was speaking up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, there were six bishops behind me, those poor guys. I'm going to be with one of them in a couple of weeks, Bishop Pentegrast, who's now in Ottawa. But anyway, there's six bishops behind me. We have 2,000 high school kids in front of me, and it's a Friday night opening talk for a Steubenville conference. I'm this preacher, the first speaker, and I get up to these 2,000 kids and I say, ladies and gentlemen, you become a saint or you go to hell. You should have saw the bishops behind me. <laughs> they all looked like they were constipated. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Now, I pulled it out, but that is the option. It's the only option you have, gentlemen. You become a saint or you go to hell. What if I go to purgatory, Father? You're going to be a saint, you miserable. That's the point. 
But you're, if, let's say I, before I walked in here and I gave you all a piece of paper, and I'd say, write me your 10 goals, gentlemen. I want to see your 10 goals. I wonder if any of you here, any of you, maybe the priest and the bishop, hopefully, but if any of you here would say to be a saint. And yet that's the only goal there is, to be a saint, to go to heaven one day. And again, if you're going to sit there and work hard for money, work hard to be a football player, work hard for anything else, you better cooperate with the grace that God gives you to be a saint. And that has to be a decision that you decide to make. And the way, again, when God calls us to do this, I'm going to tell you where it all begins, gentlemen. It begins from, this is from St. John Vianney, who's the patron of priests. And St. John Vianney says, this is the glorious duty of man, that you pray and that you love. So to be a saint, gentlemen, these are the two things you got to do for the rest of your life. Is this hard? <laughs> it is when you live it. The two things you got to do for the rest of your life, gentlemen, is you got to pray and you got to, you got to, and you got to. Let's focus on the prayer first. Prayer isn't something like, again, I did my, I do a whole year every day of my life. When I do a whole year, like this morning, I did it in the, in the, uh, my, um, hotel room, and as I sat there, I say Mass, and then I stop at the Our Father, and then I do my Divine Mercy Chap with my rosary, I do my readings and my morning prayer, and then I shut up, and I sit with God for an hour, so he can tell me what he wants. Because to be a good leader, gentlemen, what do you got to be? A good follower. If you become, you want to go and you become a man, what do you do as a, in, in the world today? You go join the Marines or the Navy or the Air Force. And the first couple of weeks at boot camp, they treat you really nice, right? You know, guys, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> oh, you're doing such a great service for your country. Thank you for coming. They treat you like garbage, don't they? Why? That's going to make you a man. So no matter what, I sit there and I do a whole year every day. Now, I'm a pastor of 800 families. I'm on the road 45 times a year. I'm an author of free books and new ones coming out. I'm on the radio every week. I'm on TV every week. I am always, I'm in charge of the men's conference, the women's conference. I have my own uh, uh, retreat program in the diocese called Divine Mercy Encounter. I, I'm all these things. So don't give me the stuff that I don't have time, Father. If you don't have time to pray, it's because your priority isn't God, right? Like at my holy hour, reality. Like I sit there and I, I tell my people, like in my parish, the men have to do the middle of the night. And sometimes the men fight with me a little bit. I do mine for the parish from 3 to 4 in the morning. I'm there and I say, I don't want women in the middle of the night. I want the men to do it. And the men look at me like, you know, I'm a busy man, Father. Oh, shut up. You're so impressed at yourself. I'm not, gentlemen. You, if I was to sit there and ask you, Jesus, please, I want you to come and spend an hour with Jesus Christ once a week in the middle of the night. No, Father, I can't. If I give you a million dollars, will you do it? Well, sure, Father, I can. Well, that means you do it for money, but you won't do it for Jesus. That shows where your priority is, gentlemen. If someone asks you to pray an hour a week in the middle of the night for a year, and they'd give you a million dollars and say, is that all I have to, that's all I have to do? I just have to get up in the middle of the night and one hour spend in that chapel. That's it. And you'll give me a million dollars? Sure. Okay, I'll do it. I bet you everybody in this room, everybody in this room would do it. I would bet you. But for Jesus to become holy, to pray for your family, to change their lives, oh, I'm very busy, you know. Sure, I get it. Huh? You know, how many of you gentlemen here, if you knew that someone was going to break in your house tonight and rob your family, rape your wife, and kill your children, how many of you would take a bullet to stop them? Wow, great men. Well, the world, the flesh, and the devil is going after your wife and kids every day. And if you're not a man of prayer, you leave them unprotected. And this is an eternal unprotection, gentlemen you got to sit there. The reason I pray every day is because I'm a pastor. And so what I have to do is I look at the world, the flesh, and the devil every day in my prayer and say, you got to go through me to get to my parish. You gentlemen, when you become men of prayer and not try, when you do become a man of prayer, you look at the world, the flesh, and the devil every day and you say, you got to go through me to get to my wife and my kids. That's your job. And if you don't do that, you leave them unprotected. So you got to become this man who decides, this is my job to help and to protect my family. 
spiritually because the world, the flesh, and the devil is going after them every moment. You do realize, gentlemen, your job as a father and a husband is to get your wife and kids to home, to, to heaven, right? Those of you who are priests, your job, Father, is to get your congregation to heaven. And you will stand before God for every soul in your parish. And so I, I do a lot of priest retreats. And not in this diocese, I, well, I'm talking about the next thing. But my number one problem with priests is they don't pray. It's different, I'm sure, up here in Green Bay. But everywhere else, the number one thing, my, my ministry is my prayer. That's bull crap, Father. If you're not praying, you're doing us no good. And so I tell the priest, you either start praying, Father, or get out. Stop being a priest. There's nothing worse than a priest that doesn't pray. You do more damage than you do good. And so, gentlemen, it's the same for you as fathers. Your job, number one, is to pray for your family. You become that for the rest of my life, I promise Almighty God, I will pray every day, period. No try. Now, you all got five minutes a day, don't you, gentlemen? Some of you, it takes longer to take a dump in the morning. Is that not correct? <laughs> you know it's true. And what are you going to do when you stand before God on Judgment Day and he'll say, how come you spent more time on the toilet than you did talking to me? What are you going to say? Well, you got to go, you got to go, right? <laughs> Prayer is the most important, right? We have the knights here. Good job, knights. I'm a fourth-degree knight. Thank you very much. I've started four councils of Knights of Columbus. My problem with Knights of Columbus is they're not praying either. They can cook pancake breakfast on Sunday. But you got to pray, correct, gentlemen? The number one thing about being a Knight of Columbus, the reason you got that damn sword is to what? Pray. That's it. That's what all men must do. There's no excuse not to pray every day. And the reason most of you don't pray is because you think God hates your guts, don't you? You really do. That's why we don't pray, because we feel guilty. Because none of us here are perfect, except for the bishop. But the rest of us are not perfect. The rest of us, we feel, I, you know, yesterday I'm getting on the plane. Well, a guy pushes himself in front of me. I cannot say in front of the bishop what I called him in full clerics. And I thought I only said it in my head, but it came out of my mouth. And everybody saw this priest who goes around the world preaching, and I called this guy, it begins with an A and it ends with an E, whole. And he turned around at me, and I says, you pushed your way in front of us and these people. I have issues, gentlemen. Great issues. And I got on the plane, and the Lord says, if the plane goes down, you're going to hell. I know. I felt so bad. And the reality is, I need that prayer. You should, I have anger issues. I went to two years anger management counseling. I'm much better, thank you very much. But again, when I do stupid things like yesterday, I'm like, really? And I'm going to go talk to a bunch of men now about what it is to be a man. And I just swore at a man who got in front of me. Then I thought, well, it was better than hitting him, so I guess that's a little bit better. <laughs> but the reality is that every time I come before God myself, I always have to, first thing I got to say is I'm sorry, because I've done stupid things. I'll be my own worst enemy if we ever come up, you know, they, have the, they used to have the devil's advocate. All they have to do is preach, say everything I've ever said, and I'm done. I'm done, because I am not a perfect person, very imperfect. But I still pray every day. Even if I go to hell, could happen quite easily. I was committed to my time with Jesus more than anything else. And so what has to happen, gentlemen, is when you get your Bibles, I'm going to give you the first place to go. And the first place you need to go is in uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 11. You'll never forget this. Just 1, 1, 1. Can everybody remember 1, 1, 1? 1, 1, 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. And I'd encourage you, gentlemen, to go pray with this until you get it. And it begins, this is when Jesus got baptized. And when Jesus got baptized, God the Father looked at him, and the Spirit came upon him, and God the Father says, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Gentlemen, no matter how weak you and I are, every time we come before God the Father, he looks at you and says, you are my beloved son, and I'm pleased with you. 
And until you get that, you're trying to fill the emptiness inside. Matt's a great speaker. He's going to be coming up next. And he's going to be talking about porn and the whole reality. Let me make it very simple. The reason most people have sexual addiction and porn addiction is because they're trying to fill up the emptiness inside with something other than God. The only thing that will fill up your emptiness is when you know that you're loved by the Father. That even with all you, isn't it amazing the way we pray? You come before God, and I promise you, God always says to you, you are my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And immediately we tell God how he cannot be pleased with us. Huh? We have bad tempers, we have lustful thoughts, you know, we have all this stuff, my inner life's all a mess. And we just say, focus on ourselves. And God looks at us and says, how come every time you come into my presence, you look at you instead of me? How come? Every time you come into my presence, you're looking at your sinfulness and your past instead of looking at me and my love. That's the problem. The deepest need in everyone's heart, gentlemen, is to be loved. I promise you. I don't care how tough you are. The only thing you want when it comes right down to it is you want to be loved. And you do everything in your power to fill up that emptiness. And so we try sin, we try money, we try prestige, we try power, we try sports, we try lust, we try pornography. Fill it up. But the only thing sin does, gentlemen, is make that hole in your heart bigger. That's all it does. You need to go every day and let that hole in your heart be filled with the love of God. You need to let God love you every day. You need to know that you're a beloved son. Huh? Now, being a beloved son then he's going to challenge you. So what I tell people, this is a great way to pray. It only takes five minutes. You all got five minutes, correct? Yes. First thing, you sit there and you say, God, I'm sorry. So you need to begin with acknowledging and humbling yourself before God. And you tell him, like last night when I went to pray and this morning, <laughs> I am so sorry, God. Why? Because I was a bad example. Why? Because I lost my temper. Why? Because I'm sure everybody there said, you should have seen what this priest called this man. Hmm? It was very bad. I'm sorry. And then you let Jesus forgive you. Because the whole reason, gentlemen, that Jesus Christ died on the cross was to take away our sins, correct? It. The whole reason. You know, it says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, you shall name him Jesus. Why should we call him Jesus? Because he will save his people from their sins. I need a Savior. I need to stop doing my sins, too, but I need a Savior. And so we say we're sorry so Jesus can be our Savior. After we say we're sorry to Jesus every day, then we say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Huh? That means, God, I exist for one reason today, to do your will. People come to me all the time and say, Father, I go, what, I'm having a bad day. I go, oh, did you thank God for your bad day? No. Did you pray the Lord's Prayer this morning? Yes. Did you say, thy will be done? Of course. Well, this is his will. Why didn't you thank him for it? Well, that ain't what I meant. Exactly. The way we should pray, and I have a whole book coming out. My new book comes, is called Just Live It. It's living the 10 principles of the world's most famous prayer, which is the Lord's Prayer. Because we say it every day, and I don't think 99% of the people know what the heck they're saying. So what we're saying there is we say, God, I want your will more than my next breath. That's what your will be done means. So I exist today, God, to live your will. It doesn't matter what I want. It only matters what you want. And that means he's going to love you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to lift you up. He's going to take care of your family. But you need to surrender to him. So the first thing you do is you say you're sorry. The second thing you do is you say, I surrender. And the third thing you do, gentlemen, and this is what's going to be so hard for most of you. Jesus says you'll never enter the kingdom. You'll never enter the kingdom. You'll never enter the kingdom until you do what? Change and become as a child. Gentlemen, to be a warrior, you need to be a child of God. You need to look at God the Father of Jesus and say, Father, hold me. And then you need to surrender yourself into the arms of your Father. And for three minutes, you need to let God love you every day. And again, when you know the love of God in your heart, you'll be transformed. You'll be able to deal with anything. If someone told you, you know, one of the great things about the story of St. Francis is a guy came up to him and says, Francis, what if he was holding his garden? And he says, Francis, what if someone told you today you'd die in an hour? What would you do? He'd say, I'd keep pulling my garden. Why? Because he was living in the will of God. And if you and I are in the will of God and we're doing his will and we know that we're loved, that no matter what the world throws at us, it's going to be okay. 
It's going to be okay, gentlemen. People go crazy about the world today, how bad it is. Well, of course it's bad. But gentlemen, we are the light of the world because of Jesus inside of us, right? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Now, again, you ever been in a real dark room? No matter how intense the darkness is, if you light a match, shh, the darkness can never overcome the light. The light is always stronger. The problem with too many men is we have been cursors of the darkness. Curses, cursing of the darkness only makes us one with the darkness. We need to be the light in the middle of the darkness. And the darkness will never overcome the light. And you become that light is when you go to pray every day and the Holy Spirit sets you on fire. You know, again, people, when I'm on the road, like this week, I leave here this afternoon, I get home to Pittsburgh, or I get to Pittsburgh tonight at 9.30, get in a car, drive to Erie, I'll be at my parish about midnight tonight. I'll have two of the masses tomorrow, 5.30 in the afternoon tomorrow, I'll get back on a plane, I fly to Jacksonville, Florida, I do a five-day mission in Jacksonville, Florida all this week, I get in a plane Friday morning in Jacksonville, and I sit there and I fly to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I will be the keynote in Grand Rapids Mission next, next week at the, their men's conference. And I'm exhausted. And people say, where do you get your energy? I get it, the Holy Spirit. Every day I pray, surrender to the Holy Spirit. Before I get up here, I talk to the Holy Spirit. And again, very simply, gentlemen, the Holy Spirit sets me on fire. And you come to watch me burn. The darkness can never overcome the light. You want power in your life, gentlemen. You become men of prayer. Don't try, do. The second thing you got to do to be a saint and be a man is you got to, according to St. John Vianney, you got to love. Ha! Now, love, gentlemen, is so different. This is love. Again, we don't learn it today. Most boys never become men in the United States today. Why? Because a boy or a teenager, what am I going to get out of it? It's all about me. When you stop being a boy and become a man, it's all about you. Who's going to love me? Who's going to take care of my needs? Who's going to sit there and fill my emptiness? I want some pleasure, and I want it now, right? And most men, if you, if you use artificial birth control, you're not a man, not even close. And some of you have your wives do it. Well, my wife uses it, not me. Shut up. Do you have sex with her? You do it too. And this is why. Because we want to do actions without consequences. That's what high school kids, boys do. Give me the action with no consequences. So a kid comes to me once and he says, Father, there is a mistake. What's the mistake? My girlfriend's pregnant. Oh, son, that wasn't a mistake. Everything worked the way it was supposed to. Huh? You had sex, a baby came. How can you be surprised? Correct? No, 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 no. That isn't supposed to happen. I want to do the deed, but I don't want a consequence. That's a boy. That's not a man. The thing I used to say to my boys, the best thing I can teach you, gentlemen, is everything you do has a consequence. You know, now in America, you don't have to work. You don't have to even try, and you'll still get money. That's the problem. It isn't making us men. It keeps us adolescents. You do what you do, and there's a consequence for what you do. And gentlemen, this is forever. You do what you do, and there's an eternal consequence for what you do, heaven or hell. Oh, I don't want a consequence. Sorry. God is a man who teaches you how to be a man. You have eternal consequences. So the first thing that you have to learn, gentlemen, is every day I got to lay down my life for somebody else. I exist today not for me and my pleasure. I exist this day for my wife, for my kids. If, I don't, if I'm not married yet, for my society. As a priest, I lay down my life every day for my parish. But the point of being a man is not what can I get, but what can I give? I will lay down my life for them. And especially when it comes to your family, gentlemen. Again, you need to be able to sit there. And I, one of the things, you know, I don't even want to even talk about this, but, you know, I do a lot of weddings every year. Don't ask me why people ask me. Just who knows why. Anyway, so every time I do a wedding, I always do the same. I do different stuff, but there's always the same thing I always do. So last year, almost two years ago, I get a call from one of my kids who was getting married in St. Augustine, Florida. And he was in the Secret Service, one of my boys I taught. And he was going to marry another Secret Service person. No, it was a female, don't worry, you're still in the Catholic Church. But anyway, so, but the week before the thing, he calls me and says, now, Father, just so you know, Hillary Clinton's going to be at the ceremony. 
I will not say what I said to him. But I sat there and I says, listen, I will be who I am. I'm not going to change for Hillary or nobody. No, I know, Father. I just don't want you to be surprised. I said, okay. So we're in the wedding. And here's my couple up here with the man and woman. I mean, the best man. And man. And over here is Hillary Clinton in the second pew with uh, Uma Wiener next to her, you know. The two of them are there in the second pew. So every wedding is the same. So I get up and I start to the girl. And my homily is, sweetheart, you read the Bible every day, don't you? And I always get, yes, Father. And then I go, you lie to a priest, you're going to hell. No, Father. And then I say, have you ever read the book of Ephesians? No, Father. Well, you know what it says in the book of Ephesians about wives and husbands? I could not look at Hillary as I was saying this. And, I, and she says, and he, and no, Father. I says, well, this is what it says. It says, wives, be submissive to your husbands. Do you think that's what it means? And I always get, no, Father. And I always go, yes, that's what it means. And I jump up and down at all the weddings. And I say, for the rest of your life, when you wake up in the morning, you got to think, how can I serve my husband? How can I put his needs in front of my own? Again, I could not look at Hillary or Uma at that time. I stayed over here. And I sat there. Now, all the women are there thinking, die, Father, die. <laughs> Another reason I hate the Catholic Church. Ah, ah, ah. Green throw up. Head starts spinning around. I kind of enjoy this myself. But anyway, so all the men are saying, I wouldn't say it, Father, but you go for it, guy. <laughs> but anyone who knows me knows I am an equal opportunity offender. The other shoe is about to fall. So I look at the guy and I say, son, you read the Bible every day, don't you? And I always get, no, Father. I say, you know what it says after it says, wives, be submissive to your husbands? No, Father. Well, let me tell you. It says, husbands, love your wives. How? as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. You know what that means, son? No, Father, your life is over. Ha <laughs> ha! Every day for the rest of your life, you got to sit there and think, how can I die for my wife? How can I put her needs in front of my own? Again, not bought in society today. I'll love you as long as I feel like it. Uh-uh. You can never look at your wife and say, I don't love you anymore, because she can look at you and say, sorry, you died for me. You're dead. That's what marriage is. <laughs> you know it. But the reality is, you give up your life. That's what love is. It's not like, oh, I, feel, I have a feeling for you. I could give less, could care less about how you feel. I'll bet that there's been days you woke up and look at your wife and think, I hate your guts. I'll bet you one or twice. I bet you it just happened. But so what? Feelings have nothing to do with love. And so what you got to do is, first of all, you got to love. And you got to, every day, put your, I, I tell people, you go home, if you haven't done it before, from hearing me before, you put three words on your mirror. I am third. God is first, others are second, I am last. I am third. And when you brush your teeth at night, do, 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 did I do at least one unselfish act today? And if the answer is no, you wasted your life in Christ. And part of that love is you got to tell the people you love that you love them. Now, again, I grew up in the city of Pittsburgh. Both of my cops were police officers. Both of my parents were police officers, huh? And cops are, it's hard. Those of you who are police officers, you know, especially nowadays, right? They treat cops like garbage. And they're the ones laying down their life for us. That's how messed up our society is. We got to support them. We got to, every day I knew that when my mom and dad left the house, I mightn't see them again. They could die. And so every time you get a call as a police officer, something bad could happen. And it's always for something bad. Someone, you know, killed somebody, raped somebody. No one ever calls a police officer and say, officer, I just want to tell you, I'm having a great day. Oh, thank you for sharing. It never happens. So some of the police officers, to deal with it, drink. And they become numb inside. Become, become alcoholics. I knew one became a very bad alcoholic. Drank, drank, drank. Left his wife, left his kids, left the Pittsburgh police force and moved to Los Angeles, Las Vegas, because everybody's happy out there, right? <laughs> Got a new wife, new kids, but he wasn't happy after a few years there. He moved to La uh, Houston because everybody's happy in Houston. But he kept drinking and drinking and drinking. And this man was quite young, 43 years old. Baby. I was a senior in college seminary at the time, and his wife called me because I had known the man. And he, he says, you know, Larry, he's dying. You think he'd come out here and be with him? I said, of course, that's what I do. I'm a seminarian, yes. And I flew out to Houston, Texas. Well, I was not prepared for what I saw. Here was this man, only 43 years of age, had pure gray hair, had no fat in his body. He looked like he was 90, dying of AIDS. And I walked in the room. I go, you look like hell. I have a negative humor. I don't know if you figured that out or not yet. But anyway, <laughs> you look like hell. And he smiled, but he couldn't talk to me. He had to write to me on a little blackboard. 
and I picked on him like I do, and I prayed for him and did different things. And I'll never forget, I was the last time I was with him, and I had to leave. And so he's laying there. We're the only two in the IC room, and he's laying there, and I'm praying with him and different things. And I said, okay, listen, I got to go. But you know this is in September, but I'm going to be graduating from college in May, and it'd be great if you could be there. And he shook his head up and down, but we both knew this wasn't going to happen. This man was going to die. And I said, oh, I'm so holy, you know. I said, oh, I'll pray for you. Oh, it's so holy, priest, religious, so up holy you are. Oh. And I walked out of the room. As I was walking out of the room, I knew it would be the last time I ever saw this man. So I turned around to look at him, and there he is desperately calling me back with his hands. And I'm thinking something's terribly wrong. So I hurry around the other side of the bed. I go, what's the matter? What's the matter? What can I do for you? And this man grabbed me, and he took me, and he held me so close to himself, and he's, he's hugging me really close to himself. I look up at his face, and I go, yeah. I love you too, Dad. And a little later, my dad died. The only time I ever told my dad that I loved him was on his deathbed. Why? Because he wasn't the type of dad I wanted. He was an alcoholic, and he was a mean alcoholic. And I spent my whole life judging my father instead of loving my father. Huh? Jesus Christ, we all say we love, and we're his disciples, and we're his followers. Great. He only gave us one commandment, only one. What's the only commandment Jesus Christ gave us? Love one another as I have loved you. Period. And then he says in John, this is John chapter 13, verse 34. John chapter 13, verse 35 says, This is how all people know you're my disciples. Because you love one another. Period. So according to Jesus Christ, the way people know that we're his disciple, and you're doing discipleship here in the next couple of years, you're going to be focusing on it. According to our founder, the way people know that you're my disciple is because you're loving one another, period. And then he forbid us to judge. And boy, we Catholics are great judges, but we're not so great lovers especially me. I am so glad that the last thing I ever said to my dad was, I love you. That's what he got to take into eternity. My dad swore he'd never be like his dad. And my dad's dad, my grandfather, was a street bum alcoholic. We'd find my grandfather in the streets in the city of Pittsburgh. We'd have to go pick him up drunk and put him in the car. And my dad said, never will I be like him. He died of the same disease that my grandfather died of. And the reality is, I am so glad that the last thing I said to him was, I love you. Gentlemen, life is too short. You only got one life here. So you got to make a decision. I'm going to give you some homework now. We're going to start with the boys. Boys, I want you to write two letters before you go to bed tonight. One to your mother and one to your father. And I want you to tell them that you love them. You got it? You can't say, dear dad, I love you, man, Joe. Shut up. <laughs> you write him a letter, okay? Fathers, if you have 10 children, it's going to be a long night. <laughs> I want you to write to every one of your children, I want you to tell them that you love them and why. And this isn't your time to judge them. Stop it. I wish you'd go to church. Some of your kids don't go to church because of you. Do you know that? You got to love them into the church. Judging them into the church will not work. I've been ordained 28 years. I promise you it doesn't work. I've tried. You love them into the church. So you tell them the same thing God the Father looks at you and says every time you pray. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. And I'm pleased with you. Stop judging them. And this is the way I want you to write these letters. As if tonight, midnight, you or they would be dead. What if this was the last thing they ever got from you? What would it say? That's how you write the letters. And then what you got to do is you got to tell the people you love that you love them. How often? Every day. For some of you, this is going to kill you, right? You know, you say, Father, I heard people, Father, I'm German. Germans don't do that. Or, Father, I'm Italian. We do it all the time. No, 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 I love you, I love you, I love you. Or, Father, I'm Irish. We do it when we're drunk. <laughs> you don't let your culture determine your faith. Your faith determines your culture. And I know half of you are looking at me and say, Shut up, Father. Who the hell are you? I'm nobody. I leave here. You'll never see me again. <laughs> some of you will see me a lot. But you know, I'm coming back for ordinations. But what happens is, you, I'll promise you, if you, sit there and do, if you sit there and do this, you're not going to be in your deathbed saying, I can't believe I told my wife and my kids that I loved them every day. Stupid, stupid, stupid. That'll never happen. 
But if you don't, I promise you, on your deathbed, as you're saying your last breath, <laughs> you'll regret your miserable life. You'll sit there and say, how come I couldn't tell my wife and my kids that I love them? Why was I so afraid? Why was I so proud? And you'll regret your life that was worth nothing. Because you couldn't even tell your wife and kids that you loved them every day. What a waste of a life. What a waste of a man. So gentlemen, esto vir. Be men. Decide you're going to pray every day. Decide you're going to be a man of love. You'll lay down your life for your wife and your kids. You'll tell them that you love them no matter what, and you'll change the world. You got it? Get it? Going to do it? That's 44 minutes and 48 seconds. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless, keep, and protect you. He who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen.